Hey, and welcome to the podcast. How are you? Doing it great. Is, it's a rainy Wednesday, Tuesday. It's Wednesday. It's a rainy Wednesday here in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought it was Friday earlier today, so don't feel mm. bad. I think you're going to have to get somebody on here to give us tips on how to track days of the week yeah. outside of our calendars, because I, I honestly get confused. But... Absolutely. I can't take days off, or I don't know what day it is. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Well, can, could you give the listeners a, an introduction of yourself, um, the company you work for, and what you do? Yeah. Man, I feel like kind of low-key famous now. Um, my name is Emily. I am a product manager in Toronto, Canada, and I work with a, um, a pre-seed startup called AgeRate. And AgeRate is uh, really, really cool in the sense that we have found a proprietary way to measure your biological age. Now, a lot of people kind of, especially, you know, in my family, they're like, oh, I know how old I am, right? You know, it's the, the number on your license, but it's not. Um, our bodies are different inside, you know, depending on various what we call epigenetic or lifestyle factors. It can actually change how fast you're aging, the quality of life you're going to have when you get older and all of that. And age rate's been working on, on that test for two years and we're about ready to launch. And now nice. my job is to bring it to life in an app, which is really cool. So that is going to be all about, you know, providing really clear access to your data, helping you understand what all of this stuff that we've told you means and looking at those DNA methylation sites where they track the epigenetic biomarkers. Um, sorry, my cat's attacking me. Uh, to, to see like, you know, is, is your age rate accelerated or decelerated? Is it uh, something that you should be concerned about? And from there, we're going to start moving into the ML space and serving you with what we're calling an intervention. So maybe you're, um, you're not a big fan of vegetables. We might be suggesting that you eat some, but they're going to start to get very personalized very fast and uh, really put you on a way to reduce your biological age and even uh, turn back the hands of time. It's very cool. Uh, yeah, it's, I'm gonna it's try really it. cool. My wife's going to try it, so we'll be, we'll be on that. Oh, I'm excited. Yeah, I'll send you info when we, we start our beta. That's in, in bed. I think I'm excited cool. about it. Heck yeah. yeah. We'll definitely be part of that. Cool. Cool. Sweet. So, you know, for years now that the talk has been around like big data and the importance of data. And mm. so companies have been like collecting data like crazy. And you, you <laughs> recently wrote an article called stop gorging on data. So, yeah. I, so I'm curious, <laughs> like where the whole thing of like, we need data, let's capture as much as we can to like, we have too much data. Where, where did that disconnect happen? Um, well, I think it, you know, the truth is anything I write about on my medium blog is just stuff that annoys me <laughs> a lot of the time. And I think that's kind of a fun thing because as PMs, you know, a lot of the time we're like, hmm, what ticks me off? And that kind of like spurs <laughs> our, our innovations. But this whole like love of data came from another role I had where it was all about like data education. And I realized how little there is in our actual workplace. And one of the things that we're the least educated on is what data we actually need. And it comes down to a point where you might be handed a task as a product manager or a data analyst or even a data scientist and be told to fix it or find something out of this. And it's a bloody mess. And nobody thought ahead of time about whether or not that data was actually required. And while you know some data infrastructure is cheap, as we continue to collect all of this, eventually we're going to hit a critical mass and it's going to become expensive. Yep. It's just how it is. You know, data, what is it? Data is the new oil or data is the new gold. <laughs> we all have all these like goofy euphemisms, but the truth is that it is very valuable stuff and companies are recognizing that. And as soon as we hit that critical mass, we might start getting charged more. So why, why store this useless stuff? If we're all in the name of efficiency, why make your people wade through all of this junk? You know, and I think that's really what got me is it was, why am I, say, asking the dev development team to put in all these tags and trackers when we don't really need them? It impedes my job because I can't figure out what I'm looking at. I'm taking age, let's say, as a, as a data point in six different areas on the app. That makes no sense. And it ends up trickling down to a point where it takes the customer off. And then what good are you doing? And like, you're not going to have a sticky solution and uh, you're going to kind of spur people away from your, your product. So at the end of the day, it, it's just one of those things that takes me off as a customer. It takes me off as a PM and I realize how the impact can like exponentially explode in your face. <laughs> no, for sure. And, and as, as I was reading through the article, this thought came to my head of like, you know, tech debt has been long talked about, right? And I think, yeah. I think now people are starting to talk more about UX debt. Right, and paying that mm -hmm. down 
but it, it seems like the next wave of debt that we need to consider is like <laughs> what what debt did we take on from our data and how can we clean that up yeah for sure i think right now some people roll that into tech debt because mm. we think of the development team as a unit right um, yeah. and and your dev team you know it could be our software devs it can be your business analyst whoever is on the team uh, uh data scientists and then we kind of forget that the debt has different values mm -hmm. and requires different levels of effort so in terms of like product manager words i guess you're not <laughs> assigning the uh, the right value to this like maybe when you're sprint planning you're kind of thinking about just development tasks in terms of software instead of like you said thinking about it as a data debt or um or you know a, a science debt really r d even like these things are are not helpful and it creates a lot of anxiety i think for the team as well knowing that they're working off of old information or confusing information or too much information right so, so you said old information so there, there's a time where you may have collected data that was relevant at one time but mm -hmm. as, as you go it may become something that's now irrelevant to track have, have you seen that come up yeah and i think part of this is a plague of of any startup life you know i've I've worked all across from a big corporate to startups. And one of the big things is startups kind of get in a mode where we're really proud of ourselves because we're tracking something. And then all of a sudden it's no longer relevant. Either we don't really use the product anymore, um, which can happen if you have a couple like iterations of things or our customers are finding ways to circumvent that. So the data becomes dirty. So mm. for instance, you're just putting in useless info, which, we could talk about a whole other thing, you know, on how to how to ask your customers, aka force, to um to participate in collection. But also we make these decisions off of, say, an analysis we did a while ago, and then we go back to that old data. So one of the things that can combat that is like a dynamic updating system, um, you know, a constant stream of data. But on the flip side, it better be relevant data or else you're kind of screwed. And that is where the delicate balance sits, is do we look at these old dashboards, these static data sites, or do we continue on a stream? And this is really tough when you're in a situation where you're right at the forefront of everything and could go either way, or when you're just thinking about the concept of big data as a network and you're like, yeah, but you know, YouTube has like, streaming data and analytics data and this and this so i should have all these things too but do you really need them right. and if you don't what could you be doing that's going to add value to your customer with your small team that much faster than tracking all of this junk because we can spend time trying to find out where in the video say a user is stopping in our uh, in our onboarding system but is that really going to help them or is it just something we're curious about? And if it's just something we're curious about in an early stage product, maybe we should just add that to the backlog for a little bit and wait. Yeah. So I can see like, even in my own mind, but I'm sure in the listener's mind as well, someone thinking, okay, so I've been trying to collect all this data mm -hmm. and I'm now probably collecting too much or I'm not collecting the right thing or I don't, I, I don't need everything. Like, I thought I needed everything. So hmm. as, as they're thinking through this and as I'm thinking through this, what advice would you give around like, how, what's your approach to identifying the right data to track? If I say it depends, that's a cop out, I guess, but it is true. <laughs> it's, and, yeah. and that's just because it depends on your product, right? Yeah. Um, however, in general, I think the question is always, instead of thinking of an analytical backwards approach where you're like, okay, I have all this stuff. I'm going to find an answer out of it. Mm. Think about what you're trying to understand. You know, are you trying to understand behavior patterns? Are you trying to understand just general trends? And and once you know that, it can kind of start to funnel you down. Or you get even bigger and more existential and just go, why? Like, why do I care about this? Why does the user care about this? Why does the team care about this? But personally, I'm a big proponent of going back to your frameworks always and thinking, you know, does it add value? So whatever value add framework you might use. Um, some people even like think of SWOT like this, you know, what are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of me investing my time in this analysis? Mm -hmm. Or what am I going to get out of this? Am I trying to find any of those answers? Um, that being said, also consider what type of data you have. Is it numerical? Is it a bunch of uh, categorical data? Is it something that really needs a lot of cleaning? Um, and how you want to display it in the end, you know, do you want it to show a correlation potentially or an anti-correlation, you know, whatever. Um, 
And how will you frame that to the business? Because the one thing is, as you become a product manager in a larger organization, you have to pitch your team's ideas to the business for a win, right? Yeah. And you're always the one who, who's in that weird spot, I think, where you get a, you know, you get the the joy and opportunity of pitching it, but also the joy and opportunity of taking the no and hearing it first, um, because the team's got other things to do and work on and, and execute on. So you're kind of in the middle there. And uh, yeah, you really have to think about, is this going to add value to my data story? Is it going to bring me forward. So a couple things you could do is look back, like I said, into your frameworks. Um, are there opportunities in this data? How old is it? Is it constantly coming in? Um, what are the, th the threats surrounding something like this? You know, is it, is it secured data? Mm. Is it kind of a weak data? So weaknesses and threats, right? Like is our system weak and uh, do we need to actually make it more robust for this to become useful? It's really interesting going through those exercises that seem so like, not rigid and applying them to something is what we see rigid as data and going, Hmm, wow. I actually didn't realize all of these things about our system or our approach to this. So I would consider that. And then there's a lot of good, interesting work out there talking about like, you know, designing your data story and all of that, which we could go on a whole other rant about. <laughs> but in the end, if you cannot get somewhere out of it, like if you're thinking, man, I have say all of this demographic data and you start to do a couple of things, you know, maybe, maybe start with the average for instance. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, this is the average age of people in my Facebook group that um, we're using to uh, qualify leads. Right. So you've got an average age and you go, but it seems kind of weird to me. So I'm going to dig a little bit deeper and break it into quartiles. Okay, cool. I see all of these different things in the quartiles, like as you start to break it down that way, you'll start to know where to like zone your focus in because you might notice that even though the average age is 35, the median age is completely different or, you know, uh, the majority of people that are actually engaging on your posts, which is a whole different problem right. are of a certain uh, age group. And those are the people you'd actually want to target anyway. So I think it's starting with basic stats like mean median mode, you know, go back to uh, to high school or when do you learn that in the States? I don't know, it but depends, um, yeah. yeah, it depends. Right. But like go back to your mean median mode, see if they make sense and then just continue to like chunk out that stuff if you really need to. Uh, and you know, if you don't want to look at it, don't look at it. I don't know. <laughs> like, no, I mean, I, th I think that's give good. Give yourself right? a break. <laughs> yeah. like going back to the thing you said earlier is knowing why why you want the data in the first place and like what are you trying to get out of it is it a hypothesis that you're trying to validate mm -hmm. is it is it assumptions that you're trying to validate or or like do you want are you trying to track something because like those are your success metrics and these exactly. are the things you need to track to prove whether we've been successful or not so i i love that advice of like kind of starting with that core why principle whenever you're looking at data yeah it totally is the theme of my life lately, um, starting with why, why do I want to do this? Why do I want to be a BM? Why do I want to live in Toronto? I've had all these like <laughs> questions coming up lately, but yeah. you can apply it so well to work. Um, and we sort of get stuck being involved with technical teams in the technical and like, Oh, would you say, I know I get a lot of questions like, what's your favorite, you know, data analytics platform. I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it depends on what works best for my team, but realistically right. what, what the best platform is is something that's customizable and easy so if that's going to be excel for you so be it right yep. you know lighter touch is good touch sometimes yeah yep. and, and then i like the point you made too about um knowing the kind of the story that you want to tell behind it and thinking about how to visualize that data uh, mm -hmm. as well Which, but, like date i heard someone say earlier that like it doesn't matter if you have the best data analysis if you can't tell the story with it then like the best analysis means nothing. Exactly. So, you know, if you can tell a story uh, about, again, that like that Facebook group of your people with mean, median, and mode, then you're all set, right? But yeah. what you might find is there's holes in the plot. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's no middle point and you're going, hmm, I should really back this up either with something external or something else that we're tracking. And that's where you can kind of build on top of it versus just going into panic mode, collecting all the data, and then going, crap, what do I do with it? Yeah. 
Yep. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, th I think that reactive approach of let's just collect everything and then look at the data and hope some magical answer jumps out is, is what yeah. a lot of people get into trouble doing. So. For sure. And then you land into this thing where people go, oh, just apply machine learning to it. You're like, that's not how that works. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a whole other shenanigan. One of my, uh, one of my mentors uh, has said that a lot. She just goes, you know what? I wish the show... Um, will it blend would be like, will it ML? Because the truth <laughs> is it won't always. And that's not always the best thing. Yeah. And that's, that really just circles back to like, it's, it's like taking out the Gatling gun when all you need is, is a, <laughs> you know, a quick shot or something. It doesn't make yeah. any sense. So you're going to find yourself in a situation where you're asked a lot more um, by your organization to create this magic, um, whether it's a magical algorithm that fixes everything or, you know, collect so much data because that's what's hot right now and that's what we need. And you have to have the, the guts to say no, but also as always um, being data driven, you have to have a reason for it. And one of those reasons might simply be that it just doesn't fit with what we're trying to achieve. Yeah, no, I, I like that. And <clears throat> I was gonna ask you about like inertia in organizations, mm -hmm. right? Because if, if there's mm -hmm. a PM listening, he's like, man, we, we track way too much stuff. I have to wade through data all the time and there's mm. irrelevant data, outdated data, et cetera. Now, how do I go back and pitch this to my team or get buy off to work on this data cleanup? Like, do, do you mm. have kind of a, a general like value proposition behind that of investing time to? Yeah, I think one of the ways I've combated this in the past is through the value prop of data literacy. And this is kind of something that I'm really passionate about, but haven't talked as much about, mm -hmm. but it's basically, I should not be the only person with access to the data. Mm -hmm. I should not be the only person waiting through the data. And much like a hack day where everybody kind of gets a crack at a problem, data literacy across an organization enables people to have hack day with their data, right? Mm -hmm. So by training up people on a certain system, like maybe you have too much stuff and you're using a looker to look through your, your SQL um, tables and whatnot. So looker kind of sits on top of SQL for those who don't know it. And it makes it a lot easier to use really. You don't need to know how to code that much. Um, you don't really need to know how to speak SQL unless you want to make some custom stuff. And it just organizes all this abstract you know, data into something actionable, but some people don't know how to use it. So by having say a looker hour where you train a yeah. couple people who want that knowledge, then they can go and deal with it. And uh, what either will happen is one, there'll be some ideas on what you could be tracking and cleaning up or two, they're just gonna feel the same pain as you and then you get some more advocates on your side. So it's a little bit self-serving, but what it also does is it does enable uh, your organization to put data literacy uh, more at the forefront because it enables people to make their own decisions and their own recommendations. And as a PM, it actually helps you because then you have to, um, sorry, then you don't have to be the idea generation machine all the time, which can often fall on us. I think we yeah. somehow people think we have like magic hats that we just pull ideas <laughs> out of, but what we really do is we sit there and we listen and we collect data and uh, think a lot about what people are saying. But when everybody has access, um, to information and the literacy capability to understand it, yeah. that's when it becomes really powerful. And it's that whole democratization of data, data literacy, which I keep talking about, um, you know, really stopping that siloed approach that unfortunately, as long as we've been talking about it for the past, what, 10 years is still really prevalent because people aren't sure about how to break down those walls. But numbers are a universal language. So if we can all see the numbers and kind of speak about them the same way, uh, we really, really enable our organization to cross collaborate and to advocate for those types of things. So I think sometimes it's really just putting the problem right in front of people and going, this is it, take a look. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's a bit of a bold approach. Maybe there's too much red tape at your place. If that's the case, um, do a bit of investigation into tools and techniques that you think could help as always come prepared you know i think this is almost even like buying a pair of shoes right you look at all the different tools and techniques you see the different features you think about what you want to do with the shoes i'm thinking of running shoes like do i want to run a marathon do i only want to run 5k and what sorts of things you need and then come with a bit of a business plan and say look i think we could save this much time with it 
And yeah, it's going to take extra effort. It's going to take you getting on some really awkward sales calls <laughs> and going, man, I don't have that kind of budget or I'm not sure they'll go for this, you know, security wise, but at least you've done some due diligence right. because that's what people rely on you for really as a product manager. So why not apply it to something that could actually make your life a lot easier. And in, on the flip side, if there's something you're particularly interested in pursuing, or for instance, you're looking to level up your leadership, you could say, if we do this, I'll also have more time for X. And yeah. that really, you know, propels my leadership development plan forward, or that would make things better for the development team. So always showing where that value is, is really helpful. Yeah. And sometimes the solution won't cost anything. Um, sometimes it's more about changing the process, which yeah, very resistant. But again, with data literacy, we can really get there and people want to learn. They're so hungry. We're all so hungry to learn and um, not act like, you know, understanding all this stuff that the PM does is a, a big secret. Like people want to know what you do. So show them. For sure. For sure. I mean, I, th I think there's so much good in what you just said there, right? Like, <laughs> like the breaking down the opportunity cost and the cost of inaction of like, if we don't do this, what, yeah. what's the, what's, what's going to happen. And then killing birds with uh, two birds with one stone, like you said earlier, where you're training the rest of the organization on data literacy, but at the same time, it's almost like a, like a user interview session where you bring the pain to the forefront by having mm -hmm. them go through it. And you're like, Oh man, that's where it sucks. But like flipping it on them to where they see, Oh, this is the pain they go through. Yeah. We do need to fix that. And then you kind of have like this coalition saying, whoever makes the decision, fix this, right? Yeah. And I think one of the big things you'll also notice, or I've, I've noticed is anybody on your team that's in like operations or sales, they're on the front lines, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and they will face a lot of pain often. So you might even start there and go like, what are you struggling with in terms of like, what do you wish you knew to make your job easier? And you might even question. hear something like, it's a question that you could answer for them. Or if, or they might go, hey, you know, I really wish I knew how many calls I had, but I don't want to ask you all the time. Like, I don't want to have to do that. I also don't want to have to track it myself. I wish it would just update for me. Then you could maybe either show them where to find that info because maybe they've been asking the same question over and over again. Or you go, oh, we need a pipeline that makes that actually efficient. And then we can build it because a lot of the times the front lines are really where you see um, those, those problems start to crop up and you go, oh, I have that problem too. Or, um, oh yeah, yeah, definitely a lot of people in the department have been asking me that I should really consider what's up. Cool. Well, and this, this has been a, an incredible conversation <laughs> and like so many, so many nuggets of great takeaways in here. And I think to, to wrap it up, I'd love if you could give some advice or some direction for someone who's like, okay, I get it. I get what you're saying. Em. I mm. understand the value in this. I think there's value in me becoming more data literate as well as the organization. Where can we go to start learning and applying this? Yeah, uh, it depends on uh, your capacity, but um, I could do a small plug here. Uh, an organization I used to work at, BrainStation, is super incredible, but they have tons of um, people that have been in the data environment actually giving the lessons that they teach. So that's a great way to start if you're interested in really connecting. Um, always networking, which is uh, something scary, but also really worth it because you get real value. Or uh, on the flip side, you just kind of type in, you know, I want to learn more about um, stats and just see what comes up on Google. I know that's not the best, like, most existential answer, but it's really true. And try free trials of different tools. Hmm. So for instance, um, like yeah, so even Tableau gives like a free trial. Give it a shot. Like, why wouldn't you want to just kind of see how it all works, right? And they often will train you up. They have all sorts of free resources. It's the same thing with um, something even like a, a product management uh, tool, I think like Product Board or, or Pendo. I, they really like, they have all their training online. So just go for it because that's free. And then uh, if you're really into the nitty gritty a bit more, but you're like me and you kind of have a hard time paying attention in lectures and whatnot, which uh, thankfully for me, I had an incredible statistics teacher, but stats was really hard for me. Um, take a look at the, if you're a reader, take a look at the uh, book, um, Naked Statistics, because what it does is just tells the story as a story. So he's going to talk about all of these like classical statistical methods in a way that just sounds like a human being. And I think that's really special. That's a good recommendation. I'll, I'll probably buy the book myself. So. It just popped up in my Indigo, and I was like, uh, Indigo is like the Canadian like chapters bookstore type thing. Um, okay. What do you guys have? 
I don't even know. What are you? What the, are your bookstores? For bookstores, Books Million, Barnes and Noble. Barnes and Noble, that one. <laughs> so it's like it's like Canadian Barnes and Noble, and it just okay. popped up in my recommendations, and I went, huh. And I'm actually really enjoyed it. But yeah, the typical answer too, just back to basics. There's something you learned in your education somewhere at some point that was was all about data, whether it was, again, um, just like simple stats that you had to take to get through uh, your college degree, give it another shot and and try. But yeah, there's just try free trials, man. There's no shame. Yeah, Matt, I'll link all that in the, the show notes. <laughs> For sure. Um, and, you know, worst case, if you really want to just listen to somebody rant about the things they're bothered about, you're always welcome to reach out to me. That's kind of how <laughs> I start all of this stuff. But I, yeah, yeah stay curious too. Think about things that bug you and then you'll you'll really like kind of set yourself on the right path cool yeah i'll put your your linkedin link in the, the show notes as well <laughs> and you said you're on on medium i am um my blog is called the mind brain which is a really silly reference to the show archer okay. <laughs> nice. um yeah the uh the scientist in it he's like talking about people's brains and he's like in their mind brain is da 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 and <laughs> for some reason that stuck for me but it's just a, a place that I'm hoping to grow and chat about, you know, AI, machine learning, the future, data and analytics, things that bug me. Um, one cool article I would point out is like, there's a, a piece I did on big data and why like the word big seems to freak us out, but it's all just data in the end. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Cool. Well, I'll, I'll link Remember your, you can do it. <laughs> yeah. I'll link your medium in there as well. So people can follow you and, and keep up with, with your mind brain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my mind brain. Oh my gosh. It's all over the place lately. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks for joining him, and uh, it was a pleasure speaking with you again. It's my pleasure. Thank you.